said, it can have all different stretch from above, under. Trevor Burke was charged earlier this year with the October 1990 murder of George Woodcock at the elderly man's Klein Street home. The preliminary hearing opened today with the presentation of police evidence, including a statement from Detective Sergeant Alex Pollock, who headed inquiries into the Woodcock murder. Detective Pollock, under cross-examination from Burke's counsel Warwick Anderson, conceded a machete which was presented to the court had no scientific or forensic evidence which linked it to the Woodcock murder. He also conceded no blood from the dead man had been found on the instrument. This afternoon, Burke's former de facto wife, Judy Dunn, made an emotional appearance in the witness box, telling the court he'd come home one morning in late 1990 with his jeans, jumper and hands covered in blood. Burke is alleged to have told Dunn, I got into a fight. More than a fight, I killed someone. You'll hear about it on the news. Dunn later told the court, I was going to tell the truth to police, but my life was in danger. Judy Dunn's evidence to the court follows an undertaking given to her by the Attorney General. The case continues tomorrow in Curry Local Court. The five kilometre long bank up of traffic started on Maitland Road at Sandgate with Roadworks limited drivers to just one lane. Those heading for Maitland and Raymond Terrace could do little but wait for the long lines of traffic ahead of them to clear. As the afternoon peak hour intensified, traffic banked up on the industrial highway and continued back along Maitland Road to the Maud Street lights at Mayfield. But police say the traffic jam has caused no major problems. Rehearsing last night for a program which includes Tchaikovsky's beautiful Symphony No. 6, the Hunter Orchestra, under the baton of Roland Peelman. Other works he'll conduct tonight include Grieg's Norwegian Dances, Rossini's Overture to the Thieving Magpie, and Aaron Copeland's Clarinet Concerto featuring schoolboy soloist Philip Green. My dad played the clarinet in dance bands around Newcastle and he used to bring it home and play it and sort of wander in and watch him and sort of be pretty amazed and so I took it up myself and now I'm playing on Hunter Orchestra. It's very hectic, there's a lot of time changes and we've been uh, working very hard to um, fit it together, um, interchanges between, between the strings and the clarinet, it's been really busy. Busy is just about an understatement when you consider Philip finished his HSC last Tuesday. Every day I'd come home from an exam, I'd play the clarinet, then go and study and put it on the side. I haven't really started working on it until, um, like full on work on it, until after the HSC actually finished. Assuming I don't lose a hand or an eye or something and I can't play, uh, I want to follow it and play in a professional orchestra like the Sydney Symphony or something like that one day. At the Civic Theatre last night, they were putting the finishing touches on Carmen. Stage, the most costly production ever mounted by Opera Hunter. We have had seasons that we've considered to be su successful before, but Carmen is, in anybody's terms, a major success. 
Tackling one of the most difficult baritone roles in the show is Michael Saunders. Some people think it's a wonderful song. It's awkwardly written for the voice. Um, I find that a, a challenge, is a vocal challenge. Also taking up the challenge are the region's most vocal twins, Susan Hawkins Hart and Karen Hawkins. Mary Ann Fraser is tackling the role of Carmen, the gypsy who captivates a defrocked priest. She's passionate, he's intense. He becomes involved with her, her relationships never last more than six months anyway. Um, <clears throat> he just simply can't handle it when uh, she decides she's just not interested in him anymore and goes off with somebody else. He says, come with me or I'll kid you. And she says, um, I can't, I have to be free, I can't live any other way. So he kills her and that's the end of the album. The show opens tomorrow night at the Civic Theatre with six performances scheduled over the next week. There are a few tickets available. The Newcastle Police Youth Club will host the titles and the club's boxers are already firm favourites, irrespective of the fact that the bouts will be held on their home turf. Four Newcastle boxers are already in the State Police Club Olympic Development Squad and it's expected after this weekend a few more will link up with the New South Wales amateur boxing team preparing for the Sydney Games. 13-year-old Fred Gibson from Garden Suburb is regarded as an almost certainty. It's his first year in the ring and already he's won three major titles. His training partner, Daniel Bell, was living on the streets a few months ago but since starting with the club is back at school and throwing the leather like he's had years of experience. The first fights start tomorrow afternoon at 5 o'clock with the final scheduled for lunchtime Sunday. It doesn't look like it, but this site was planned to be a cricket ground. $49,000 allocated by Sports Minister Kelly to build an oval and practice nets in Maitland in the marginal Labor seat of Paterson. The opposition says it's buying votes. The Labor Party says it's all above board. I'm going to keep on asking ministers for money because this is what we need in this electorate and that's my job. It's part of what's become known as the sports rorts affair. Ros Kelly accused of giving Labor electorates across the country favoured treatment with $30 million worth of sports funding. Despite the opposition claims of no development applications, the government says the East Maitland Cricket Club submitted plans nearly two years ago. A series of sites were checked, the latest put on hold as the land may be contaminated from an old gas works. Adding to the controversy, the Labor candidate for the state seat of Maitland, Tony Keating, is a life member of the cricket club. And Mr Keating admits to being instrumental in setting up the funding bid. And that's lobbying, and uh, to identify a need in your community and, and set about doing something to rectify that need. And that's what we've done here, and uh, that's what we will con continue to do, because we believe that's uh, what the people expect of their politicians. According to member for Patterson Bob Horn, his electorate received around the average amount in funding. Peter Ryan, NBN News. The Backpacker Consultative Forum has been set up to investigate opportunities in the budget travel industry. Tourism Minister Michael Lee says the market has enormous potential, with more than 160,000 backpacker nights spent in Australia last year, worth around $1.5 billion to the economy. While the unsolved backpacker murders have cast a shadow over the budget travel industry, Mr Lee says it has had little effect on the number of backpackers coming to Australia. He says it's important people realise the difference between backpacking and hitchhiking. Perhaps we need to provide people with more information about the dangers of hitchhiking rather than tell people that it's that there's any uh, threat or, or any difficulty in travelling around Australia. 
Because the industry has so much potential, Mr Lee says it's important we market it well overseas. We uh, are going to see if there are ways that we can um, market Australia better, particularly on university campuses in the United States, uh, Europe, Japan, because we think that if we can attract people out to Australia on a backpacking holiday once when they're young, we've got a better chance of attracting them back um, a second or a third time when perhaps they've got a young family or they're retiring. Jodie McKay, NBN News. The promoters are saying the Yanks are down under. The Aussie boxers saying they'll be under the ropes at the end of the fight. Spike Cheney looked cool and collected. Cheney's opponent Tom Alexander was looking fit. There were no real problems at the weigh-in. Shannon Taylor and his opponent Lewis Masonette cruising through. Costa Zoo wasn't looking for any fights and with the weigh-in out of the way it was time for a quick snack. But the two visiting Americans decided to go a little over the top. One fan quipping it could be their last supper. The first fight gets underway at the Newcastle Entertainment Centre at 7.30 tonight. The Emmerville farmer was working on his property when he was thrown from his horse. The Westpac Lifesaver helicopter was required just before 10 this morning to rescue the man. Paramedics arrived on the scene first and stabilised him before the chopper arrived. The patient was then transferred to the helicopter and taken to the Armadale and New England Hospital. Tonight the man remains in a stable condition. Jason Neuenhoff, NBN News. The toy toting bikies were not carrying the cuddly teddy bears and children's games for their own enjoyment. The bearded ones were in queue to present their toys to the Salvation Army. They will be given to underprivileged children as part of the Salvation Army Christmas toy appeal. Harley riders from as far as Sydney and Brisbane converged on the hot hog for the event. A barbecue and live music by local band Cockatoo was put on at the renowned bikie stop-off for the presentation. Jason Yornhoff, NBN News. Thirteen to eight and favourite, seven to four and eight to one. At Mooney Valley, the fifth was the Sunny Crust Bakery's handicap over one thousand and six metres.
14 to 1, 7 to 1 and 9 to 1. The unplaced favourite at 9 to 2, Sal Quida. Rachel McQuillan's entry in the Newcastle Classic will be a sentimental occasion. It's been four years since the 21-year-old from Merriweather has played a competitive match on her home turf. Today she was sparring with another local, Newcastle men's singles champion William O'Neill, who's also out for a slice of the $3,000 prize pool. Returning after a four-week spell, Rachel will use the Newcastle Classic as match practice for the Australian circuit, which starts in Brisbane on January 1st. I think um, there's a lot of young girls that are, that are good that are playing in it and I should get a lot of good matches out of it and also it's nice and close to the Australian circuit that's coming up. Despite some impressive doubles wins, it's been a bad year for McQuillan, whose singles ranking has dropped from the low 30s to around 105. But she says she's been working on a new approach, which she believes can help get her ranking back into the double figures. I've changed my strokes a great deal, my grips and the, the way my strokes look um, and also my serve, I'm changing that practically all the time and uh, just to get more power and more consistency in my game and, and introduce my net game more too. Catherine Lamont, NBN News. What better place to advertise woolen fashions than in a wool store? In a special travelling show, the Golden Fleece is promoted as the perfect material for every day and night wear. It's a push to get the wool stockpile down and farmers' profits up. In the audience, farmers and their families from across the northwest, and although some looked a little out of place, this parade could well represent the future of their industry. The theme of the night, wool can be practical, fashionable and inexpensive. Federal Minister for Industry Alan Griffiths opened the centre in front of 50 local business people. Australia wide this is regarded as a crucial breakthrough. Uh, it will be uh, watched very closely by federal government. It's a, it's a first and uh, you'd have to say congratulations to the region. The Industry Development Centre, located next to Newcastle University, will be a middleman between Hunter businesses and the federal government. The centre will provide information on how the government can help a particular business, including how to improve performance or obtaining government assistance. Well, there's no doubt that businesses frequently are not aware that there is assistance that's specifically available to them. They don't seek the assistance because they don't even know of it. The Minister believes the centre will help the hunter become more competitive in the international business world. This country is a sophisticated trading nation able to meet and beat the best in the world. Your region is a big part of that story. Jason Neuenhoff, NBN News. Newcastle Mayor John McNaughton opened the appeal at City Hall. This year's appeal is expected to be one of the biggest in its 112-year history. Do you think with the recession that the appeal is needed more than ever this year? Oh, certainly, certainly. I think it's, uh, according to the people in the St Vincent de Paul Society, this is the greatest uh, need time since the Great Depression of the 30s. So it's, you know, over 60 years ago. So it's pretty tough. Organised by the Catholic Church, the 1993 appeal is expected to top last year's $300,000, which was used to feed and clothe 3,000 people in the Hunter. We're appealing for cash because um, that enables us greater flexibility in the sort of services that we provide for people, but also for non-perishable food and for clothing. 
Donations can be left at any St Vincent de Paul Centre or Catholic Church. Jason Neuenhoff, NBN News. As the fire brigade tried to save what was left of the Mayfield home, nine-year-old Kira Griffin wept on the footpath outside. When the fire started, she'd been at home with her brothers and her sister's six-month-old daughter. It just went boom, straight up in flames. Kira grabbed the baby from the beanbag she was lying on. I thought that she was already dead because the smoke was up in there and we were nearly touching the beanbag. Two neighbours ran into the house to help evacuate the children. By that time I was on fire so we were interested in getting the kids out and a little girl had a baby in her arms so we got her out. Soon after the fire started, baby Charney Lee's mother, 15-year-old Kylie, arrived home. I went for a walk down to my auntie's place for a couple of minutes and I just seen fire, smoke and... I had a feeling that the house was on fire. The mother of the six children and grandmother of Chani Lee was also located. The contents of the rented house weren't insured. The Salvation Army will provide the family with temporary accommodation. Fire Brigade officers say the children are lucky to be alive. What caused the blaze is a mystery. The fire investigation squad is still investigating. Jane Anderson, NBN News. The $350,000 new complex in Smith Street, Charlestown, represents the results of months of planning. With staff contributing to the design, the centre features new style job boards, expanded waiting and seminar areas, as well as streamlined and confidential service counters. Upstairs is Lake Macquarie's CES regional office. Every week the Charlestown CES assists hundreds of people in job related programs playing its part to reduce the number of unemployed. And today the job of officially opening the new building went to Federal Member for Shortland Peter Morris. It's a substance that's become part of the Aussie culture. Australians consume 130 million litres of alcohol a year. That's an average of more than seven litres per person. In The Hunter, a recent survey revealed that 15% of men and 8% of women drinkers believe their levels of consumption were too high. Assisted by $150,000 in federal funds, the Hunter Centre for Health Advancement is researching the problems of alcohol abuse. With counsellors based at community health centres, it plans to study the effectiveness of two strategies, one looking at possible changes to behaviour, the other focusing on intervention. We 
haven't been very sure about what the best way of, of counselling people with alcohol problems is. In fact, nobody's terribly sure of the best way to go about doing that. And this project is to help us design a more effective counselling service for people. Health guidelines recommend no more than 28 standard drinks a week for men and 14 for women. Anything over and you're at risk of developing an addiction. Particularly when their friends may be consuming the same kinds of amounts, they don't look on themselves as being very different. Um, but nevertheless, alcohol can be having quite a big impact on their life. Melinda Smith, NBN News. A sculptor since the age of 16, Lenore Boyd has spent the past 24 years casting the human experience in bronze. This latest exhibition features 25 works on show alongside the paintings of Francis Fussell. I love flowers. There's such a variety of um, flowers. There's an endless variety of flowers and fruit and colours and sensual shapes and patterns. The majority of my work here are still life, so inspiration, flowers, fruit, bowls, pattern cloths, colour. I love colour, as you can see. Frances Fussell has been painting for three decades, first taking to canvas 11 years after migrating from Holland in 1952. It's taken 15 months to put together this exhibition. Featuring some mixed media but mostly works in oil, the floral inspiration for many of the paintings was gifts from friends. But this wattle was plucked from the side of the road. I took it home, I put it, composed the picture with some Dutch jugs that I had at home and a cloth. Built in 1832, Campbell's store was derelict by 1986. Responsible for its transformation into Morpeth's tourist mecca, Trevor and Shirley Richards, who today celebrated the end of seven years' work. We're very proud of what we've been able to do to restore it right from uh, almost a derelict building right up to where now it's something admired and enjoyed by lots of people. Their finishing touch is an art gallery, now featuring the work of 11 local artists, including Minmai's Bill Freeman, who draws inspiration. Mostly from the Hunter region, because there's so much to do here. I just love the bush because I was brought up in the bush. I was a timber cutter for, for years. The old houses, they're gone forever. And you've got to have a record of them somewhere. Seascapes, well, I love painting them when I can't go fishing. That's when I paint my seascapes. For Patterson artist Val Anderson, the region's historic buildings provide plenty of material. My technique is um, uh, pen and watercolour and it, it more or less depicts um, the historical aspects of the Hunter Valley. Uh, I'm particularly interested in local history and um, it, it's lovely to have a, well it's more or less a hobby really, um, that goes hand in hand with my artwork. The gallery opens tonight and will continue to show traditional works by local artists. Phones at MBN offices throughout the state have been running non-stop today with thousands of people seeking information on Project Restart. Ambulance stations have also been inundated with calls which have jammed switchboards. They've asked callers to contact NBN only. 
Project Restart kicked off last night on MBN with a one-hour documentary focusing on the American city of Seattle where most of the population knows CPR. Many lives are saved by the simple procedure which keeps oxygenated blood pumping to the brain until ambulance officers arrive. Here in New South Wales though, relatively few people know how to carry out cardiopulmonary resuscitation. It's a situation which the ambulance service desperately wants to change. We look at Australia last year, 29,000 dead across the country. We've got a huge problem on our hands. If we can do anything like Seattle is doing in the United States, where they're saving six out of ten of those people, we're going to put a lot of people back onto the streets of our cities and towns. On Saturday, CPR training will be carried out at 53 ambulance stations around northern New South Wales. It will be the largest training session ever carried out in the country. It's a mammoth exercise to coordinate, but one which doesn't daunt the ambulance service or the NBN team of Glenn Cook and Jim Sullivan. A year ago, they began planning for Project Restart. Now the dream of saving lives is about to come true. When Newcastle Council introduced a weekly recycling program for glass, plastic bottles and newspapers in October, it was overwhelmed by the response, with 30% of the city's 50,000 households participating. Now Council wants more people to get involved and has introduced special bins made from recycled plastic to make things easier. It makes it more convenient for people and it's uh, tidier, it looks tidier out on the footpath. In, in Sydney, uh, where there's about 40 councils uh, all involved in weekly recycling, or largely weekly, they found that when they introduced the crate system, their participation rate went up by about 25%. Mr Pinfold says people don't have to purchase the bins for recycling collection. Newcastle residents will receive pamphlets in their letterboxes this week explaining how and where to get the bins. To complement the crate scheme, Council is also selling worm farms. Worms will eat virtually anything other than glass and plastic. They love paper, they love cardboard, uh, they love food scraps. The worm farms are a patented design, they're fly proof, they don't smell. The end product is a fertiliser for household gardens instead of the city's landfill. Catherine Lamond, NBN News. The coaching team started at Toronto High School this morning. Targeting Year 7 students, they found most children who weren't playing weekend competition had hardly ever picked up a bat and had very little experience with cricket. The two-hour classes were aimed not at correcting style, but trying to make children enjoy the sport. Yeah, hopefully if they pick up one or two things, it's a, it's a bonus. They can go away and practice it and that, that might help their game down the track. One of the coaches, Dean War, younger brother of the test pair, says they are uncovering an enormous amount of talent. A couple of good girls actually, a couple of good bowlers. So, you know, the girls' cricket's pretty strong in Australia at the moment, so we encourage the girls as well as the boys. Tomorrow the group will hold sessions at Mayfield, Lambton and Cardiff, with a special class planned for the Newcastle junior rep teams in the afternoon. Marshall Soper claimed the Breakers were only a basic team and won't be able to continue their early season form. And instead of making him meet his words, the Red and Blues fell down around him. A minute later, the 32-year-old former Socceroos striker was at it again, proving persistence pays off. Newcastle keeper Clint Gosling was forced to work his heart out, but no sooner had he fended off a raid and Soper was ready to pounce again. Before the game, Newcastle was flying at the top of the ladder. The loss dropped them six spots and leaving them with plenty of work to do to improve their percentages.